thank you very much. You're all very welcome. Um, and delighted that you can give up your lunch hour, some of your lunch hour, uh, to join us today. Just to run through um, our regular member forum, provide a bit of an update on what's happening within the MPA um, and within pharmacy uh, wider um, and more general. I'm very pleased today to be joined by my colleague Helga Mannion, who many have met before, um, the MPA policy manager. And we also have Danielle Sheridan and Jenna Booth from Inspire, um, who's going to give you a little bit of information on some work that we're doing with the organisation through this very special year, our centenary year. So um, we'll have a little look, as I've alluded to, the, the MPA centenary um, and the Inspire partnership um, that we are delivering on this year um, to mark the, the events for celebrating our year. Um, we we'll have a little bit of a look at some of the new representation and support issues, um, an update on learning and development, and then anything else that you want to bring up that we haven't addressed. So without further ado, um, we'll just push on. Um, as Ashley has said, everyone will be on mute. So um, do use the chat function um, and raise your hand if there's something that you want to um, uh, mention or uh, follow up as, as we're going through. Um, and I'll ask Ashley, maybe if you keep a wee eye on that because I'm working off a laptop today, so I just can't see everybody all at the one time. Um, so, as you, many of you are aware, this is our 100th year celebration. So the MPA has been in existence for 100 years since April. So um, from April 21 right through to April 22, with a series of events to mark um, this very special centenary. Um, and it's probably a different year than we'd planned, um, given the, the impact of the pandemic, but um, nonetheless going to make it a, a really special celebration of our members. Um, and really see it as an opportunity to promote and celebrate the work of community pharmacy and, and this year probably more than any other year um, and to raise that awareness with our stakeholders um, the wider healthcare community um, patients and the, the our potential workforce coming through um, the generating I mean already from April um, although quite muted I suppose and um, there is a little bit of buzz about the, the, the anniversary and we will build on that through the year and um, so the our press and, and comms team um, are working really hard for members across the UK and um, so you'll have seen um, perhaps on our website and, and getting some publicity our pharmacy stories um, and that's an opportunity for members to participate in the centenary to celebrate within their own pharmacy and practice and their own community um, and to lend um, those good news stories um, and achievements to, to, to the MPA and to um, the broader pharmacy family. So make use of that opportunity any way that you can. If there's anything um, noteworthy and to celebrate, um, certainly can escalate that for you. Um, we've started with um, articles on some of our uh, longer serving members um, and some of the, the oldest pharmacies in the networks throughout um, each of the four countries. So uh, building on that. Um, we will link with <clears throat> our, all our other pharmacy stakeholders um, so that the message is coherent through um, all the bodies in, in Northern Ireland. So working closely with our colleagues in CPNI um, <clears throat> in Pharmaceutical Society and Pharmacy Forum um, and with the, our board um, and then pharmacy professionals uh, across the, um, the, in all areas of work that, that they practice in. Um, I suppose the, one of the, the key points of our year is our partnership. Um, and in Northern Ireland, we're partnering with Inspire Wellbeing. Um, so Danielle and Jenna, are here today very kindly to give us a little bit, bit more detail on what we can do to celebrate um, the relationship between MPA and Inspire um, and how that can mark uh, the, the centenary. So we've worked, we've partnered with a, a mental health charity in each of the countries and certainly Inspire will be familiar to many of you uh, given their connections to pharmacy um, through the, the Pharmacy Forum Pass Committee. Um, but also, I suppose, to help us um, highlight the, the significance of the role that a pharmacist has in mental health 
um, help to provide signposting to the support that's there for, for teams. Um, and also, I suppose, an opportunity to, to raise some funds to mark the um, event um, and support a really good cause. So Jenna and Danielle give us a little bit more information on Inspire and their charity of fundraising that we're, we're hoping to launch. Um, spoiler alert, I suppose, on it is to keep the date of the 26th of September free. Um, so those from a, a Gaelic footballing background, no longer All-Ireland Sunday. So um, need something to fill the void and hopefully we can um, have an activity that'll um, uh, tantalise and, and get you involved there. So I'll hand over to, I'm not sure if Danielle or Jenna are uh, taking us through, but um, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for letting us join you this afternoon. Um, my name is Jenna. I am the Assistant Director for Insight, Engagement and Innovation Team, and I'll let Danielle introduce herself. Hey, everyone. I'm Danielle Sheridan, and I'm the Fundraising Manager for Inspire. Thanks, Danielle. So, um, yeah, we just wanted to kind of um, chat to you this afternoon, um, tell you a little bit about um, Inspire and some of the um, ways that we can support you and how um, we can inspire some of the fundraising. So um, just to start off, I'll just um, kind of say what Inspire is. So we're an all Ireland charity and social enterprise, um, and we work with people living with mental health, um, intellectual disabilities, autism and addictions across um, Ireland. Um, and what we try to do is we try to ensure that everybody that uses our services or anybody that's um, in the public live with dignity and realize their full potential. Um, we're very person-centered um, and we believe in a culture filled with compassion. Um, and one of the big areas that we work on is um, campaigning against stigma and trying to break that stigma and um, having people um, the opportunity to talk about their mental health um, and to talk about their um, disability, but focus on people themselves and their abilities. So that's what we kind of do. And we do that through um, community um, community wellbeing services. Um, we do supported housing um, and we do support groups as well. So, um, and counselling. So we have a wide range of um, services to kind of help us achieve our values and goals. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about our history. So um, Lady Wakehurst um, established Neve, which was what we used to be called um, the Northern Ireland Association of Mental Health um, in 1959. And she set up um, the service because uh, her son had um, was living with mental ill health and there was no support out there for him. And she was just a mother that lived in um, South Belfast, lived in the community and just wanted to. Um, the support um, and to build a community and um, to provide support for her son so that he could um, live his life to the full, learn new skills, um, develop his own little community. And um, she fought really, really hard for that there to be opened in South Belfast. Um, because as we know, um, you know, the history is um, about institutionalizing people that live with mental ill health. Um, and that's certainly not something that we um, believe in as an organization. So 60 years later, um, we're 60 years old last year. So over 60 years ago, um, we have continued to grow. We um, are still that beacon of hope that is um, in communities across Ireland, just similar to yourselves as community pharmacists. Um, and we have expanded our services to um, not only mental health, but addiction, and specifically looking at that dual diagnosis of mental health and addiction. Um, we um, a few years back we opened services in autism and ROI um, and about 14 years ago we have our um, intellectual disability services across Northern Ireland. Um, what I would say is that we are definitely thought leaders and experts in our field in that mental health addiction and intellectual disability um, and we pride ourselves on developing new and innovative services to support those living with mental ill health. Um, and what I really find whenever I listen to Lady Wake, her story is that her passion and her heart and her soul of um, having that community based support for people living with mental ill health um, to let, allowing them to live their own lives. That's what we still champion to this day. And that's the values that we instill as an organization across our staff and those who use our services. And it is just that basis of community and wellbeing support. Um, and we continue to work in, in that way. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So um, our last year in numbers, and these are kind of a bit skew with because of COVID, but um, we delivered just um, shy of 49,000 sessions for employees and students through our Inspire Professional Services. So that's counselling support that is available through our employee resilience programme. Um, we also support people um, through mental health, addiction and learning disabilities um, through community wellbeing, supported housing and non-supported housing. And we we supported over 5,000 people across Northern Ireland. Um, through our addiction services, um, we provided um, over three, I'm number dyslexic, so you have to apologize for me because I always look at these numbers and go, what did they say? Um, so just over three and a half thousand counselling hours through our addiction services. And we continue to expand our services um, in Belfast and the Western Trust with those um, with through our addiction services. Um, we have a, a campaign that we call um, Inspiration Point Campaign, um, and that is providing well-being, um, well-being and mental health uh, resources to um, the population. Um, so that's a public facing campaign. And um, we have just over five and a half. Nope. <laughs> there you go again, 550,000 wellbeing resources that we distribute across Northern Ireland. And what we've done is that we have kind of taken on board um, the, the current climate that we're in and we have digitalized our inspiration points and digitalized a lot of our campaigns, including um, campaigns for World Mental Health Day, for Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, and we continue to kind of um, share those wellbeing tips and advice for people to kind of look after their own mental health and wellbeing. We have a massive digital footprint and um, we have over 31,000 followers across our social media, um, which kind of averages out between now about between three to six million um, in the year of reach um, that we have on our social media and our website um, kind of reaches about just shy of 250,000 um, website views a year. Um, and what we continue to do is we use that platform to showcase um, the work that we do to campaign for, um, for our anti-stigma work and for mental health wellbeing and resources. But we also then champion the work that we do with our partners, including the National Pharmacy Association. So we really can't wait to get started and to really amplify the amazing work and the amazing partnership that we're gonna be having. So um, that's me done. I'm gonna pass you over to Danielle and she's going to talk a little bit about what you guys um what we're what, how we can help you and um and what we've kind of got planned for you over the next year thank you so much thanks Anna. yes yeah, so i'm just going to cover a wee bit um about why we're here and what we can help you um and provide for you and your communities and um, to support you in your fundraising for inspire and celebrate your 100 years so how you can help us, yeah, obviously fundraising for our services to um, enable us to continue to deliver the services and expand on them. And as Jenna talked about the inspiration points, so we have digitalized it. Um, so it would be great if your stores could place an inspiration point in your pharmacy. We can provide a customer facing and a staff facing so you can have two separate um, inspiration points. And this allows your customers um, and your staff to access wellbeing information on their phones. So they can do it at home in privacy. They can just scan the QR code and then go take it away and um, look at the information when they're um, in their own environment and more comfortable. Um, and again, taking away that stigma of maybe like lifting a leaflet where people don't want to. So the inspiration points being digitalized is a great way to do that really um, in privacy. And then, as Anne alluded to earlier, um, we have the MPA 100 challenge. So the MPA are looking members to um, fundraise around the number 100. And there's lots of great ideas, which I'll cover um, in a wee while. But the Northern Ireland spin on it um, is to take on our challenge of the Ulster Way, which is a 1000 kilometre route around Northern Ireland, which we can do in teams um, and just build around that 100 mark. Um, and another way to support Inspire's messaging is to support our campaigns, as Jenna talked about, um, World Mental Health Day, Mental Health Awareness Week, Suicide Prevention Day, Time to Talk Day. And you can do this in your uh, branches or on your social medias just to share the messaging and raise awareness. Um, we also have loads of um, opportunities to volunteer with our schemes. And again, you can choose an opportunity which suits you, which suits your staff. Um, it doesn't have to be one opportunity fits all. We can do... We can really work and bespoke these opportunities to yourself. And then just finally join us in celebrating this. We hold the Workplace of Wellbeing Awards. Um, I think this year they're going to be virtual. Um, in September, we're thinking of. Um, so really join us in campaigning and celebrating for that. Um, so the next slide is around the 
MK100 challenge. So yeah, we um, are celebrating 100 years since MPA held their first board meeting in April 2021 is the 100 year anniversary. I'll not even try and work out when that was. But as part of those celebrations, they've partnered with ourselves in Northern Ireland, Sam H in Scotland, and Mind in England and Wales. And right across the UK, they're holding flagship events. So as Anne gave a spoiler alert in Northern Ireland, our flagship event is the Sunday, the 26th of September. And we are thinking, but again, this is um, open to members to feedback and let us know what they think of this, is to do a 10K walk around the North Coast. Um, and then in two weeks, so the week before the 26th of September and the week after, so from the 19th of September to the 3rd of October, your teams could complete that 1,000 kilometres to show that we've walked right across Northern Ireland in our teams. Um, and as a, as a National Pharmacy Association in Northern Ireland, we have taken on the Ulster Way. So I think it's a real great message. But what else can you do around the 100 um, theme in your stores? So these are just some ideas I've had. Um, and I'm really open to hearing members' thoughts on this um, and seeing where we can help in store as well, because we're really, as Jenna said earlier, we're really leading the way in innovative. So we would love you to come up with your most innovative ways of using the number 100 and letting us see what we can do to help you do that. So some ideas I have is to hold a coffee morning for 100 minutes or serve 100 buns. We all know everyone loves a cup of tea, a cup of coffee and a chat. And the real thing about this is that we can use these fundraising challenges as a way to connect with our communities as well and to talk about mental health and to really raise awareness. Do 100 star jumps in store, 100 minutes of Zimba or 100 miles on a bike. You might wonder what that's got to do with mental health um, and raising awareness, but we all know exercise is a great way to just clear your head. Um, and again, you know, doing this in store really starts conversations with customers and with staff. Um, create a conversation starter board and get customers to contribute to 100 different conversation starters. Just another way to get people thinking about talking and, you know, really listening to each other and how can you ask a friend a bit more information. And finally, just a bit of fun. Can you build the tower of £100 coins and how many towers can you build and how long can they stand? And that's a great way to get kids involved, you know, kids coming into the pharmacy, can they put another pound on and keep that tower standing? And we can have a bit of a competition across all the members and see which store has the most towers. So that's just some ideas from us around the 100 challenge. So how can we help you? Just the final slide, Anne. Yeah, so what can we, how can we help you? So we can provide you with that inspiration point. So you can take the digital inspiration point, which is just a poster, or if you wanted a bit more of the information available to have, you know, um, physical copies in store, we can provide you with that. Just let us know, get in touch. You will have a dedicated relationship manager and myself and Jenna is always available to help as well. I can have regular meetings with you if you want some help um, to help you plan, review what's happened and, you know, set yourself some targets of what you want to achieve across the year. And I'm very happy to work with you to help you do that. And I can also develop um, a bespoke fundraising guide for yourselves, for each member or for just um, Northern Ireland in general. Uh, we can provide fundraising materials and support with planning for your events. We can provide you with some potential training sessions if that's what you're interested in um, and really engage in your staff. I think it's really important when it comes to fundraising to get your staff on board because when staff are engaged in coming up with the ideas, they really buy into it a lot more. So I'm really happy to engage with staff in your branches and um, to work with their ideas and make them come to life. Um, agree some brand and placement across your branches and uh, finally get an engagement out there and um, I think Anne spoke about sharing some of your messages some of your stories so we would really love to hear those stories as well and we would love to make them into some videos and um, if someone wants to tell their story we could make them into videos um, and share those across your social medias just to really raise that last bit of engagement so that's just some ideas from Inspire and how we can help um, your members and your employees. Open to some questions. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I, I suppose just to reiterate that, and given um, the, the success and the, the highlight or the, the publicity that the Ask How You're Feeling campaign through the Living Well campaign has had over the last couple of months, mm -hmm. um, it just really shows that 
you know, having that time to, to speak to someone and, and to engage with both the people we work with and, and, and their patients and public coming in, um, just the, the smallest little gesture um, can mean an awful lot. So it's, it's really um, just building on that and, and celebrating that, that the, the role that community pharmacy has. So we will be in touch um, over the, the coming weeks. Um, both there's, there's two arms to it. The um, event that we um, are holding on the 26th of September up on the North Coast um, to encourage as many um, pharmacists and their teams and their families to be involved in that. Um, and then, um, to, uh, you know, to take something around that and to do something um, locally and within your own practice and your own community um, around the 100 theme. Um, so, you know, ideally, if there's an ultra marathon runner, I mean, they could just do the 100 miles all in one go mm -hmm. and that would be one done and dusted. So um, throwing it open, um, Sheila, anyone out there? No one's taking it on. <laughs> <laughs> she isn't smiling knowingly. Not, not right now. Oh, oh sorry. Uh. So, um, well, thank you very much, Danielle and Jenna. Um, and we'll, um, we'll share your details and we'll, we'll get some more information out um, and how people can register their interest and, and become involved. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, everybody. No problem. Thanks. Just Thank conscious you. of time, so just going to keep rattling on if there's no more questions there. So just having a little bit of a look at some of the recent representation and support pieces locally. Um, so you may have picked up in their weekly news that we've relaunched our In Pharmacy magazine as a digital copy. So instead of receiving a, the paper copy through every um, eight to ten weeks uh, in pharmacy is now um, as a digital edition. So um, updated frequently. Um, if you sign up to the updates, then you get the content pushed through to you as um, new information is added, um, and it's available through our website as well. Um, for anyone participating in the UTI service um, with the independent prescriber and PGD. We have an SOP to support your delivery of that. So available on the website or can be accessed through the, the board's suite of resources to support the service as well. You may have picked up um, launch just about a month or so ago. Oh, laptop's falling over. We have our pharmacy task planner. Um, so I have a few paper copies of this. It's also available on the website that you can pull off the monthly planners as you need. Um, it's a, a good summary of all the legislative health and safety uh, contractual requirements that need to be completed. So it gives you a, a good checklist um, to, to be able to tick off that all the requirements and all the paper chains are in place. Um, and quite good for um, helping with handover or delegation of activities. So if anyone wants a paper copy of it, as I say, I have a few here, um, just drop me a wee line and get that out to you. The other piece of work that we're working on at the moment um, is in relation to the Department of Health, um, who have launched a duty of candor and being open consultation. Um, and this has come off the back of the inquiry into the hyponatremia related deaths. Um, so one of the recommendations from the inquiry was that there will be a new duty of candor and being open um, commitment placed on organizations and individuals. Um, there's a similar duty of candor in, in other parts of, of the UK, but probably what sets the, um, the requirement here aside is that the, the duty has also been placed on individuals um, and the recommendation from the inquiry team was that there would be a criminal offence for a breach of that duty of candor. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's quite a departure from where we're at at the moment in terms of, of whistleblowing and, and the duty of candor within our own code. Um, the consultation is looking at a number of proposals um, and especially around the, the criminal offence for the breach of, of the duty. Um, on an individual. Um, so uh, within the consultation, they examined the, the proposal maybe for um, 
the, the, the duty of candor is applied to individuals, but without the criminal sanction, or that there is a criminal sanction where um, an individual has perhaps withheld information or destroyed or tampered with information um, or provided false or misleading information. So, um, it, you know, elements of failure to be an open um, are subject to the, the, the criminal uh, sanction um, as opposed to just the, the broad sweep of it. So we are currently looking at the, uh, the, the consultation on behalf of our members um, and in line with our colleagues in our indemnity, um, but welcome any thoughts that anyone has on that. The consultation runs to the 2nd of August, so um, certainly a little bit of time to, to read and, and consider. Um, but if anyone has any particular thoughts or wants any clarification on it, um, we, we can um, have a look at that individually. And the last piece, um, and certainly over the last couple of weeks, um, has just been, I suppose, the awareness through community pharmacy um, of the provision of PCR tests um, in relation to fitness to fly um, and testing on quarantine and, and coming back. So quite a fluid situation. Um, at the moment, um, we have partnered back earlier in the year with Medicspot to provide PCR testing um, and MPA members have a preferential rate um, in terms of purchasing those tests for onward distribution to, to patients. Um, there has been, I suppose, quite a shift in the market um, and you probably have seen locally uh, the likes of Randox um, advertising quite extensively. Uh, for the, the test products that they provide. So um, Medicspot as, as our business partner, but other providers are working quite hard to um, revise their offer um, and just in terms of cost uh, to, to look at how those can be provided more effectively. Uh, I suppose the benefit that Randox has is that um, their testing uh, or their lab um, allows for maybe a, a more cost effective model um, but they're quite resistant to supply through uh, other outlets other than directly from themselves at the moment so I know some of the companies are in negotiation with them and with other labs um, to uh, to get a product that's um, I suppose price sensitive enough um, to be acceptable in the market um, but also to, to use um, pharmacy as a, a point of contact for patients to be able to pick those up um, and then handle the, the testing and reporting piece behind that. Um, and I suppose we wait and see from government decisions as to uh, how much we will need those as we go through the, the rest of the summer and into the autumn. Um, I'm going to hand over to Helga at this point, who's going to have um, a quick whiz through what is changing with workforce developments and, um, and Brexit. So Helga, you're very welcome. You're on mute. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So sorry about that. Um, how, how nice to see you all, albeit rather virtually. It'd be lovely to be there in person, but hey-ho. Maybe next time I could join you on one of those Ulster walks because I can imagine the scenery would be absolutely breathtaking. But can anyway, if uh, your background there, Helga, was something it's a Cornwall. Bit more spectacular. Yeah, it, it, it's actually Cornwall. Sadly, I couldn't find any pictures of Northern Ireland because I've not yet been to where I wanted to go to Northern Ireland. It's still one country I need to visit. Um, so um, hello again. I guess I'm just going to give you two uh, updates, really. One would be around the workforce development, um, and the other one is the unmentionable Brexit and the impact it's having on medicine supply. So if I were to start with workforce policy, um, we, this year we have seen the launch of new initial education training standards for pharmacists, and these have been uh, co-produced by PSNI and the GPHC, and they they are reflective of what pharmacists was expected of pharmacists now with the new current landscape. They've emphasized the science and the clinical standards. We've always um, said as the MPA, you know, that the standards tend to be heavily focused on communication skills or what we call soft skills, which are very, very important, but 
you know, we are still at, at the end of the day, a science degree. We are what you call the scientists, the chemists on the high street. And I think that is great. That's now reflected in the standards. So that by the end, by 2025, the registrants, so not registered yet. Yeah. So the registrants so would be those students about to enter the, the degree this year will become uh, qualified independent pharmacist prescribers upon qualifications. Now, how these standards are being implemented in each of the nations, the four nations, is up to that particular country. And each country determines as to whether the independent prescriber qualification is a prerequisite to then become a community, uh, sorry, a pharmacist, or in some cases be a pharmacist first, but then the, the student, the pharmacist will be given three, four months to be able to finish a qualification independent prescribing. As I said, every single country is going to be um, looking as to how that's applied. And I'm sure, because we are, Anne and I uh, talk regularly and more so than I, to an ICPD. So I'm sure you will be consulted and informed of what this would look like in Northern Ireland. Um, and also in addition to that, therefore, the pre-reg year, what we know is a pre-reg year for pharmacists from this year would become known as the Foundation Pharmacist Programme. And again, each country, so you will have already should have received some communication from an ICPLD um, as to um, you know, what elements of this new standards are going to be implemented from this year. Um, they are also working, um, an ICPLD, are working on a programme work streams to try and bring the rest of the workforce up to the same level, because otherwise what you don't want to have is having a two-tier system where those of us who qualified some years ago will be seen as inadequate, if you like, as opposed to these new ones, um, up-and-coming pharmacists. The MPA has already highlighted we are a key stakeholder uh, at central level, but also at the local level, and we have regular conversations with everybody, including the pharmacy schools councils, who I understand have been heavily involved in the assessment strategy that has been written with, with the APA, uh, RPS. Um, this, I've just mentioned, the uh, Foundation Pharmacist curriculum and the assessment has been um, drawn up by the RPS. Again, we at the MPA were involved in this, and this is now up for consultation. And yes, I know it's an RPS only, but obviously, ultimately, that whole framework could be adopted by any health education institution or training provider. So we do know there's no need to remind us all that um, following the 2016 referendum, um, there was a decision for the UK to leave the EU. And since then we started off, and in fact, some of you were involved. We had a task and finish group at the time to try and work through what sort of implications um, would apply to community pharmacy. And we have continued to keep abreast of all developments that could impact on the independent community pharmacy. But there's still one issue still unresolved, and I don't need to tell you this, which is that of the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol, which will come into effect in January of next year. Um, we are aware that if certain considerations are not taken into consideration, there could be an adverse impact on the medicine supply to Northern Ireland and therefore public health of patients. Um, and between us, you know, the NPA, all of us here involved, have raised these concerns with the UK government and also the regulator, the MHRA. And quite recently, we've also raised these issues with European stakeholders. And we also understand that the HDA and the BMA have also raised similar issues, but also from their specific perspectives with the European counterparts. And again, we have compared and shared notes with each other. Um, we raised this as recently as two weeks ago in a closed European meeting with EU delegates um, the view at, at that meeting, again, confidentially, it was meant to be a European meeting where you would have had Malta, Cyprus and Ireland um, talk as to the implications of Brexit on their own specific medicine supply. But uh, I understand these countries did not have representation. So I'm pleased to add that the whole meeting was focused on Northern Ireland, therefore. Um, our European stakeholders did have an opportunity to share because I give them, them our concerns in writing. And we understand that um, EU is keen to take a pragmatic approach to the medicine supply issue. But as just like you, you guys obviously listening to the news and watching this closely as we are, 
the silence is absolutely deafening. And I was hoping as we were writing this, weren't we, Anne, that some sort of outcome might be uh, come out today, but I've not heard anything. So it'd be interesting to understand um, if any of you have heard. But just to put it into context, uh, some of the issues we've raised include, but not limited to, the consequences that may include a reduced supply of medicines from the wholesalers, having to dispense and supply off-label and the patient safety consequences, notwithstanding the insurance liability concerned with that. And we've also raised the anecdotal report, and I'll be Anne and I were both interested to learn more, if this is the case, evidence, that some wholesalers are now using two different price tariffs. That's really giving us great concern, really. Um, we, we are continuing to petition all key stakeholders about concerns, even as recently I attended a roundtable with industry groups as well. And again, I raised this whole issue and again, looking to see, again, who else we could petition, just so that everybody, everybody who could possibly be fully aware is actually aware. Um, we haven't written formally to the EU commissioners because what we didn't do, want to do is undermine the UK negotiations anyway, but at least we've used all the connections and all the relationships that we have in Europe to, to share this. So I guess all I want to add is please uh, continue feeding any evidence you have, particularly things around um, the Department of Health is collating all the out of stocks at the moment. Um, so that is really key and it's really good to get it from, from you guys as well at, um, at, at, uh, at ground level, if you like, but also firm evidence that there are tariffs, two tariffs being used, you know, one for Great Britain, one Northern Ireland, that would be quite helpful because at the moment we don't have any hard evidence with that or any other evidence that could help continue to highlight the, the difficulties and the concerns that we have been raising. So the last wee bit we wanted to look at is just um, our learning and development um, team. And for those that engage um, or have recently um, started a, a colleague on a new course, you'll have seen quite a few changes in our learning and development um, over the last 18 months or so. So we're in a process of making some significant improvements um, to a number of key areas in the in our, in our content, but more how it's delivered and the, the patient and student or the patient the student experience of that. Um, so probably first amongst that um, is a range of digital solutions. Um, so a lot of our courses have now migrated on to a learning academy, um, which means that students and supervisors can use the course, um, access it on phones, devices, um, and you know, quite intuitive um, to, to use, to learn, to follow through, gives the opportunity to move with, within the, the content. Um, so most of the courses are now um, on this platform and the remainder will come online in the next six um, to nine months. The, that is supported by um, <clears throat> a, a lot um, of developments within each course. So um, how the material is presented uh, has changed, um, how the student can interact with it in terms of the, the quizzes, the test of their knowledges, um, just the, the interactive hotspots. Uh, it makes the learning a little bit more alive and, and fun um, and just a much more varied presentation than a very static, um, bland presentation within a, a handbook. Um, there's facilities within it to help to change colour, to change background, um, that are um, appropriate for those with um, any of the, the learning difficulties in, in terms of number word presentation. Um, and that greatly improves the, the patient's ex or the, the student's experience of, of using the resources. Um, I suppose wrap around that um, is in terms of our enrollment process. Um, so really from a student or supervisor, um, you, you'll not notice a lot different, but um, it means that by um, improving how we enroll students, there's a faster turnaround for them um, and you can get students um, registered and started their learning um, quite quickly without waiting on um, the, the very manual um, paper processes to come through. But probably the bigger benefit um, certainly at an individual pharmacy level or as a group level um, is the training report. Um, so as an educational supervisor um, or a, a manager or an owner, you can track 
um, the students progress through the, the course um, and you have a, a real time um, overview of, of where they're at in terms of um, what content they've accessed and, and their progress through that. Um, and then at the end point, um, students will now receive a new certificate that can be printed off. Um, but that's the benefit of um, making certificates easier to find um, and to keep hold of. Um, so never again will we have the excuse that someone has moved house and they've lost it in their mummies from 15, 20 years ago. The certificate now will be in a an e-wallet e for people to, to, to hold on to. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our new courses, Many of you have given us great feedback on the combined medicines counter and dispensing assistant course. Um, this has been really well received um, because it lets a new employee um, come into your pharmacy and work from medicines counter across the dispensary from day one. Um, so the combined course gives them the, the skills to work right across the, the, the practice. Um, and, and that's proven really popular with students and, and with the, their pharmacists. Um, also really good enrolments this year with our accuracy checking for dispensers course. So previously to complete an accuracy checking qualification, you had to have a technician, a level three qualification. This new course has been approved for those with a level two with a dispensing assistant qualification. Um, the caveat or the governance that goes around that means that the, the student who completes this course is accredited only to accuracy check within the practice um, where, they, where they've trained or the, the SOPs of which they've been trained with. So um, they can, you know, if they complete it in a single pharmacy, they are entitled to practice as an accuracy check and dispenser in that pharmacy or across the branches of the same um, group of pharmacies if they're, they're working to the same SOPs. Um, and that certainly, um, it, it opens up that qualification to a lot more people. Um, sometimes the level three was a barrier um, to someone who had really good accuracy checking skills, but were just not going to progress on academically to the, the, the level three qualification. Our level three qualification is now um, about six to nine months into delivery. So the, the students who've come on at the start are now about a third of the way through the, the course. Um, and that's, it's proven really popular in terms of the, the, the format of the learning within it um, and the, the, the increased support that's there for the student and the supervisor. Um, there is a barrier um, in terms of the costs associated with that course and the time associated with it. Um, and one of the things that we're working on at the moment is looking at the potential for an apprenticeship, a level three apprenticeship, so that that content could be delivered as an apprenticeship wrapper. Um, and we're working with a number of providers locally to see if we can um, get a, 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 a course that um, meets the the requirements of the apprenticeship um, and then the, the, the knowledge requirements. Um, so we'll see, because at the moment, the only way to access a level three apprenticeship um, <clears throat> is through some of the further education colleges. And they tend to operate the apprenticeship on a, a, a volume basis. So if they don't have enough students, they don't run the course. Um, so there's a bit of a chicken and egg, um, you know, get the students in place then for the course to run. Um, the issue through delivery through the colleges is that um, it's a day release program generally. So you have to be in proximity to one of the campuses. And traditionally, they've been delivered um, in Bangor, um, Lisburn, and Enniskill. And the Northwest, uh, Derry had one for a period, but um, haven't always. Um, it's been very dependent on numbers. So um, keep an eye on that. Um, we we'll certainly hope to have an announcement on that in the next few weeks, whether um, there is that potential for a level three apprenticeship. Um, the, the student support um, has also been improved through our courses. So um, students always had access to our learning development team, but now um, they will have a, a, a name contact um, and 
at someone who will proactively engage with them. So, um, you know, we'll check in with them as the, the course is progressing, being able to check that they're online and or on, you know, on the right track in terms of their, their course submission and, and completion. Um, and that's really, I suppose, this year more than any, you know, a lot of students, their learning has halted or faltered a little bit, just given the pressure and commitment um, to the day job um, and, and coping with all the pressures that the pandemic has given rise to. So, um, you know, if, if, if we know that the student is slipping a wee bit off schedule, we can certainly then put in um, a, a better uh, time scale for their completion. But it's just having that engagement so that we don't pitch up a month before they're due to sign off and you know they're, they're miles and miles behind so it's keeping that communication open the whole way through we also have a new document that's a guide to the training which um just gives a really good clear outlay of the time commitment involved with each course um the completion time what that means in terms of the hours that you personally and your supervisor um, needs to spend um, and that gives people a really clear insight of how that will sit alongside the, their job and um, so that's available to download and um, worth having a read as an employer but also sharing with anyone who's um, supervising students going through the, the courses. Um, we have improved our CPD hub of old and um, so now rebranded as MPA Learn um, and that's available on an app now as well, which just makes it a lot easier to access um, and, uh, uh, you know, can run alongside other applications that you have open. Um, the, 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 the other two key benefits of it, um, you can set up study modules for your employees and as pharmacy manager or employer, then track progress through those. Um, and that will soon be linked then as well to the Learning Academy. So the students that are going through uh, a level two qualification um, will be able to map relevant modules across into their, their training. So it gives a little bit of supportive learning um, and, and additional content to um, uh, help them along. And the final piece just um, is in relation to our vaccination training and PGD. So you probably have picked up this year that we have changed our provider and um, so for the first time we're working with ECG training and um, to deliver our vaccination skills training and with pharma doctor for the provision of our PGDs including our, our flu PGD um, and this has proven to be really good partnership it's, it's been um, really well received by members uh, not least because there's really competitive pricing but also a much greater choice of packages so um, just for vaccination skills, there's some training dates coming up, you'll see through June, July and August. So if anyone needs vaccination training, um, certainly give me a wee call or have a look on the website um, and we can work around those dates. Or alternatively, I know I've been in touch with some of you in relation to if you have a cohort of, of um, pharmacists requiring training, putting something um, bespoke for you uh, around that. Um, the pricing, as I say, is really competitive and the, the range um, of options um, has been increased um, in terms of the, the training available. Um, also around that, I mean, we always think of PGDs in terms of flu um, and we are waiting this year, I suppose, for confirmation of what a commission service will look like and how that will sit alongside our, our private service. But there are a range of other oral and topical PGDs. Um, and certainly with the introduction of the UTI service, um, it's interesting to see the public's appetite for um, accessing uh, PGDs or accessing uh, medicines and treatment through other sources, um, not least because of the, the difficulties with other parts of, of primary care at the moment. So that's just a sample of there's over 30 other PGDs that are available that can be delivered. Um, with the, the, the appropriate training and, and the PGDs back up with it. Um, so I suppose the, the key bit to the partnership both with um, ECG and with Pharma Doctor is just the support that's there. So um, this is support through the training, but also you have the ongoing support from our uh, pharmacy services colleagues, um, but also a range of marketing materials to help you with your 
uh, private service delivery, um, so be that flu or any of the other PGDs. So greatly enhanced package of, of support um, in place for that this year. And that brings me a minute or two over, but um, to the end of the content today, if there's any questions or queries, happy to take those. Um, or otherwise, we will share the slides with you um, and any of the links. Or if anyone wants one of the task planners, certainly give me a, a shout and we can get that out to you. I hope everybody managed to get a wee bit of lunch as well. And thank you very much for your time today. And we'll, we'll see you all soon. And as Helga says, hopefully maybe um, face to face in the, the very near future. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. All Thanks, the best. Bye. 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 Thanks, Helga.